So now we're going to talk about the dynamics of the chemically dependent family. And for this, we, we start off with the previous lectures material, especially when it comes to what is addiction and how does addiction develop. So for this session, when we're talking about the chemically dependent person in this family system, first of all, I'm going to begin with the stereotypical family. So I'm going to begin with dad being the alcoholic or addict, mom being the codependent, and then a bunch of kids. Okay? When you see how many kids I describe, you will know we were talking about Catholic families. Okay, so that's the way we'll understand that. Okay, so the, the first role and the way the cards are set up and the way the, um, uh, the handouts are set up, uh, each role has its own page in your handouts and its own card. In the middle on these charts in blue letters are the internal feelings that are most prominent with this role. The words around that have two terms that, that are used. If you come out of a strong psych background, these are called defense mechanisms. If you're coming out of an addiction background, we call them survival skills. So these are things which could be interpreted as a negative behavior, or in the addiction field, we see these as growing points that you can begin where what was a negative can be transformed into a positive, into something that is a skill that's transferable, that can be turned from something what, that was um, hiding your addiction, and these are things which once you enter recovery, they can be transformed into positive survival skills that can help you grow in life and work. Okay, so the first person we're going to talk about is in the stereotype here, dad, the chemically dependent person. And if you remember uh, from the previous session, that personality profile of the addicted person, that's the end result. Now, you remember that a person grows into that personality profile, okay? In the very beginning of their substance abuse, they don't come across as being addicted. They don't come across as being very negative in anything. They're, very, they're relatively successful socially. So here we have chemically dependent person. When you're dealing with someone who's chemically dependent, these are the primary feelings that you have to work with. Pain and hurt, some of it physical, some of it psychic. Shame and guilt, loneliness and fear. Now for these feelings, pain and hurt, sometimes it's physical. Sometimes as the disease progresses, you're having physical damage done to some of your body parts mostly internal stuff. Okay? You're also dealing with the pain of the social aspects created by stigma and the hurt of being rejected sometimes because of your addiction. So pain and hurt is both physical and psychic. Shame and guilt, and I find this extremely important for clients to understand, because most clients don't understand that these are two different things. Culturally, we tend to think they're the same. The way I try to help people understand it, uh, guilt is when I violate someone else's rules and I feel bad about that. An example, I get a DWI I, I didn't violate my rules on it. I violated the state. The state is going to deal with me as a violator. I'm, going to, I'm going to probably going to be found guilty, and I will feel guilty. Shame 
is not when I violate someone else's rules. Shame is when I violate my own personal ethic. So guilt comes from the outside of me. Shame comes from the inside. There are two different things. Now, I've been reading recently in the paper, the Pope's been coming out with things like, <laughs> I, got, I got really guilty on this one. The Pope came out with a thing recently and said, I never refused someone forgiveness of sins. I said, oh, <laughs> I think I do. When people come into confession to me, and I'm dealing as a priest confessor, but I'm also a therapist. People come in and they try to confess shame. Now, I spend more time talking with them than most. But I'll say, well, you know, I really can't forgive that. Because shame is not a commandment against God. Shame is within you. The only one that can forgive shame is yourself. And for that, you need counseling. So I'm not going to forgive it because it's not a sin. It's a feeling that you have. If you violated a rule, you violate a commandment, you violate law, you violate agreements that you have with people, that's a sin. That's guilt. But shame is something you have to deal with from inside. Um, people will walk out like, what just happened? <laughs> They're not used to a priest saying, I can't do that. But I think it's important for people to understand. And I find that most often with people who are in, reco in early recovery or who need to be in recovery. Now, there are some people with some psychiatric diagnoses that will also fit into that scenario, but it's there. So shame and guilt are important things to understand, and it's important to understand the distinction between the two. Loneliness and fear. Fear is because as the addiction gets worse, you never know what's going to happen. And you kind of start getting paranoid. Now, there's two kinds of paranoia. We're going to talk about this in the third session, too. One kind of paranoia is what most therapy models and most disciplines will talk about. It's a fantasy paranoia. When you think people are after you. With addictions, we have a different model. We do understand fantasy paranoia. But there's another kind of paranoia that we deal with more than fantasy paranoia, and that's real paranoia. With addicted people, there's a probability that they are fearful that people are out after them. There's a probability that family is out after them to get them into treatment. There's a decent chance that police are out after them. There's a decent chance that the probation officer is out after you. There's a decent chance that the people you owe money to are out after you. In my experience, someone who's in late stage addiction, if they're not paranoid, they're out of touch with reality because they should feel paranoid. Okay? So some of the fear is based on paranoia, both real and fantasy. Loneliness is really interesting. Many years ago, um, Mother Teresa of Calcutta was in Philadelphia for the Eucharistic Congress. And she was kind of known about and that sort of thing, but not as much as she eventually was. She was part of a press conference. And someone said to her, or asked her the question, what is the most devastating of human conditions that you've ever experienced? Now, this is a woman who was working with the untouchables in India. That's the lowest of the low of the social status. Good people were not allowed to even touch them, which is why they frequently died of disease and died alone. She was asked, what's the most devastating of human conditions? And her response was, 
the loneliness of an alcoholic. Now, considering that India doesn't have a large population of alcoholics because they don't drink, and in most of the states you can't even buy alcohol, the fact that she came out with the loneliness of an alcoholic kind of gave a God slap to everybody. What's she talking about? Well, we have to remember she came from a culture of Eastern European, at the time Yugoslavia, where the use of alcohol, especially among males, you worked hard, you played hard, and you drank hard. And the rate of alcoholism was rather high. So there's a decent probability that her experience with alcoholism came from her family of origin and possibly what motivated her into religious life, which we'll talk about when, you, when we get a little further. But loneliness is a key issue when you're talking with people with addictions. It's something that they try to get out of, and they try to get out of it by medicating it. And the main course for healing is getting out of loneliness and isolation and getting into community and fellowship. A major part of addiction recovery is in group therapy and group recovery. When I get a client who doesn't want to go to groups, doesn't want to get involved in group therapy, only wants one-on-one -on -one counseling, I get very blunt with them. And I say it's going to be much harder for you to get into recovery because you're reinforcing the isolation of addiction. You're trying to keep the secret just between you and me. And the reality is for real recovery, you've got to get a larger group. And that's why I recommend either group therapy and or 12-step uh, recovery programs as a way to do that. If somebody is vehemently opposed to 12-step recovery, then I'll try some smart recovery, some women for sobriety, that sort of thing, as alternatives. But you got to get that community interaction. Okay. So they're the feelings that you're dealing with. Now again, these feelings do not begin all at once. They kind of grow, and these are the end result of addiction. So as time is going on, these folks develop ways to keep the secret in and keep everybody else out. So the way they keep everybody else out, they become very good at manipulation. They learn how to manipulate systems and individuals so that they can't attack my addiction, my internal self. They come across as very righteous, very charming. And we all know the, um, the classic example of the early stage alcoholic. They are so nice. Everybody loves them. But that's because that's a way that they keep people out of the internal feelings. They come across sometimes with a lot of anger. Because if I'm in a relationship with you and you present yourself as angry all the time, that's a way of keeping me away. And to be perfectly honest, I don't want to be around you. I don't want to put myself in the midst of a bunch of angry people. So I'm going to stay away. Come across as rigid. And here's where we saw an evolution in thinking about rigidity. In the early days, mostly from psychology background, the implication was rigid personalities become alcoholics. What we have come to understand over the years in the addiction field is that part of the development of chemical dependency is that as the addiction is developing, we start to learn to anticipate our feelings and behaviors. So I now know that when I drink like this, I will feel like that. And once that gets rigidly put into our personality, we come across as rigid personalities. But it's not. It's a reaction to learning how to live 
as chemically dependent. As people get into recovery, one of the main things they have to lose is their rigidity. Now in the very early stages of recovery, sometimes people get so rigid in their recovery that if anybody says anything that they can't find in the big book of AA, then it's no good because they're too rigid in their recovery. Okay? So part of recovery is learning to be open to other techniques, other styles, um, other interpretations and that sort of thing and get rid of rigidity. Other things are grandiosity and perfectionism. If you've ever had to deal with somebody who was grandiose or perfectionistic, why do you not want to be around them? For every reason in the world. They are just obnoxious people to be around. So when they come across like that, that's a way that they have learned, I will keep people out of my life by coming across as grandiose or perfectionistic. So they develop these skills which keep people out of their own self, out of their lives, keep them all at distance. And again, this, it starts off low key, develops into something very strong. Now, this person is kind of growing up in young adulthood, not that bad, a lot of fun, a lot of charming and all that sort of thing. He comes across a future mate, someone we call the codependent or the co-alcoholic or a co-addict. In the early days before codependency was a term, I, just by talking with me you learn history because I've been around so long. Originally we didn't call them codependents, we called them co-alcoholics and co-addicts. The idea was they were the ones in relationship to the addict. Okay? Now we call them codependents. I'm not overly enthused about the term, but that's what I deal with. Okay? So the codependent or the chief enabler at the time. Internal feelings. Pain and hurt, same as the addict, except here the pain and the hurt is based on the pain and the hurt that comes from this person towards this one. If there's violence in a relationship, the pain and hurt may be physical. It's also psychic. As the addiction's getting worse, there's more rejection and blaming of her. Shame and guilt, same thing. Loneliness and fear, same things. The one that's different here is anger. This person develops a in very internalized anger and among the reasons is how the hell did I get myself stuck with this one? And they turn the anger into themselves. What happens when we turn anger into ourselves? Depression. So very often the codependent person or the co-alcoholic, will also have a co-occurring depression. Depression, anxiety, very common. Another reason for anger and fear, part of human development. As she's growing up, she has a relationship with her father. Now, given the percentages here, I have to be careful. Do not throw things at me, please. But I have, a, I have a sister, so I know this. In early years, the relationship between father and daughter is very special. It's daddy's little girl. And the protection that takes place between father and daughter in those early years is unbelievable. Now, as times go on and as late and late adolescence and early adulthood go on, that close loving relationship starts to become a battering ram. Right? 
Now, a little sideline, and a few of you here know my sister. Um, my sister died a couple of years ago. Um, my sister called me off at the called me at the office one day to say she was pregnant with her second child. Now she didn't get married till she was thirty five, so she was on a bit of a rush here. So the first one was a boy. She calls up, says, "I'm pregnant again." This is like nine months and a week later. Okay. <laughs> And I said, oh, that's quick. <laughs> said, well, you know, Joe's 13 years older than she was, and they want to be able to have a decent family life and all that. So um, I said, well, that's great. Do you know what you're going to have yet? No, we're going to wait and see. So she calls me up a few months later and says, it's a boy. I said, oh. I said, I was kind of hoping I'd get a niece out of this. And I, I assume that you and Joe would have wanted a girl so that you had a boy and a girl. She says, no. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, I'd be happy with any baby that comes along, but I was a 16-year-old girl. I never want anybody to put me through what I put mom through. Okay, And that's when I kind of learned there's something about 16-year-old girls <laughs> that can be challenging. Okay. So there's a point at which this girl is growing up. Her relationship with dad is now starting to get a little more adult relationship rather than my little girl. And she brings home the first boyfriend who she's madly in love with. And dad says, and I quote, He's not good enough for my little girl. And she says, nope, this is the one I love. This is the one I'm going to marry. I'm going to have 17 kids, all this sort of thing. And you're going to love all the grandchildren. And he says, no, he's not good enough for you. Meanwhile, mom says to dad, shut up, pay for the wedding, and smile. And the wedding goes on. Now, it's 10 years later, his alcoholism, his addiction is getting worse. She's now feeling a lot of the loneliness and anger because she's alone. She can't go to her closest support group and say, he's got a problem because she's afraid of hearing the words, I told you so. We will do anything in life to not hear the words, I told you so. So she starts coming across very manipulative because she wants to manipulate information so that nobody knows. She will come across as very fragile and with a lot of powerlessness. People think powerlessness is powerless. Coming across as powerless is a very powerful activity. It is a sign of strength because when you come across powerless like that on purpose, you are manipulating other people. Powerlessness is a form of manipulation. Okay. They come across with a lot of self-pity. Poor me. A lot of self-blaming. And regardless of how far we have come with women reaching new levels of rights and power and all that, you talk to most people in this situation, most women, they will still say subconsciously or maybe verbally, if I had been a better wife, he wouldn't have drunk so much. And you have to get rid of that. Okay. So that self-blaming is not there. They start becoming super responsible and super serious. So their personality style starts to become very straightforward. They become very controlling. Remembering here. 
his addiction is being surrounded by these behaviors to protect anybody from getting in. She starts developing the same kind of pattern. Internal feelings being protected by these things. In this situation, they cannot be in love. Because love is an emotional relationship. These two people are now learning how to live by keeping their feelings in in inside and keeping everybody else out. They become dependent on each other's behavior, not on the emotions. So she becomes addicted to his addiction. He becomes addi more addicted not only to the chemical, but to her behaviors. That relationship cannot be a loving relationship. So there needs to be, in treatment, a whole thing on getting them together emotionally. Okay. So that's, that's your core of the family system. Now, I'm going to use an example that I've had several times. I'll tell you about the first time that it happened. Uh, I was asked to do an intervention on a psychiatrist. And um, he was doing a lot of outpatient work at a mental health clinic. And um, we had people on staff. The director had called us and said, I think this guy's got a problem. He's exhibiting a lot of the behaviors that go with addiction. Could I come in and kind of work with him for a while? So I did. Complete denial about addiction. Absolutely 100% denial. But I kept working with him and that sort of thing. What I eventually found out, he was not the addict. His wife was a cocaine addict. And he was trying to treat her with all the psychiatric shtick that he knew. And it wasn't getting any better. So I started talking with him more about, OK, how do we intervene to get her into appropriate treatment that is not given by her husband? Because <laughs> you're not supposed to treat your family members. Okay. So um, he eventually started to think like that. And as we uh, developed our relationship over the next several months, I went in one day, and he said, we finally decided how to stop using the cocaine. And I'm thinking, oh, she must have said she'd go to treatment. And he said they had a long discussion and decided they would have a baby. <laughs> now, has anybody had this experience in their treatment before? Don't be surprised when that happens. It happens a lot. Now, there's something to be said about it, but it's not all very good. There's a little bit of good in it. So child number one comes along. Child number one, for a label, is called the family hero. Now, the family hero comes into the family system. And it's kind of interesting, because prior to the first child being born, there was no family. Russians have an interesting congratulatory phrase on the birth of their first child. The phrase is, congratulations, today is the birthday of your family. Because you go from being a couple to a family. And once you've gone through that transition, you know that date night is no longer what it used to be. Okay? The child is now the center of the family. Okay, and all relationships develop around a whole different set of values. So this child is born. Intuitively, the kid knows, I need love, I need nurturing, I need all those things that the human being needs. Even though they can't verbalize any of this, they know it. 
So the kid has an internal need to be touched, cuddled, warmed, get all the positive strokes that come along with parenting. And the problem is he's now living in a relationship where the other two people have learned to keep their feelings in and keep everybody else out. So the internal feelings, some hurt and anger, loneliness and confusion, most importantly for this person, inadequacy. This kid is growing up with this feeling that I know I need the emotional connection. I know I need to be touched, cuddled, warmed, cared for, but I'm living in a place where everybody keeps their feelings in and only relates on a behavioral level. So yes, they're cared for, but they don't have the internal feelings that are needed. So the lifestyle, the behaviors that develop out of this. Oh, and with the inadequacy, basically it's, I keep working harder for support, but the harder I work, I don't get a response. So it's built-in inadequacy training. They come across as being all together, very special, very success oriented These kids work very hard for approval. They become super responsible because they're trying to do everything right because they want to get all the positive accolades that they feel they need. So if they do all that kind of stuff, they get all good grades in school. They became great in athletics. They become good in social groups, take on leadership roles, doing everything that they feel they need to get emotional stroking. But the only responses that they're getting are behavioral responses. They're not getting the emotional bonding that they need. Now, one of the other things about this role they will ultimately develop an independent life away from the family. This kid will never run away from the family. And the reason is, this is the kid that proves to the rest of the world that mom and dad are not screwed up. This kid is so good that mom and dad say, our family's fine. Look what a great kid we're, we're raising here. Star of the football team, head cheerleader, head this, head that. We got to be doing a good job, but it's all behavior. So this kid will not run away because if they run away, this kid's identity is messed up. Because this kid's identity is based on productivity, achievement. And if this kid admits that mom and dad are in an addicted relationship, this kid's identity falls apart. So the inadequacy gets reinforced by needing to get better. Since the kid doesn't get the positive responses, he's not working hard enough, so he works harder and harder and harder. In the meantime, he learns to keep his feelings in and keep everybody else out. Okay. Child number two comes along. As the family's growing, mom and dad's relationship is getting worse because of the addiction. This kid says, I'm the best thing out there. Child number two comes into the picture. And believe me, this happens. I've literally heard the words. Dad's addiction is getting worse. Mom's codependency is terribly entangled with it. 
the first kid is so perfect, this kid is looking for emotional bonding, can't get it, the three other people in the family, keeping everybody in, keeping everybody else out. This kid, the feelings are hurt, anger, rejection being a primary one, loneliness and fear. And the rejection is, and I say, listen to your families when you deal with them. And I've heard this literally time after time. This addiction is getting worse. It's harder and harder to cover it up. They will tell this kid, we never had problems in our family until you came along. And that's where the kid gets the title scapegoat. Because everybody starts blaming this kid for all the problems. Because this kid has bought into the denial of the family. Kid still needs the social network, the, the social bonding, not getting it. This kid feels rejected by everybody else in the household. So they start developing strong peer values. They come across as very withdrawn and defiant, very sad, a lot of negative acting out, a lot of early drug use and unplanned pregnancies. That's the way they do it. Kind of a scary thing. But this kid does not perceive themselves as part of the family because everybody else is keeping their feelings in and keeping everybody else out and they're not getting the bonding so where do they get the bonding strong peer values this kid will pick up with uh, a, another group of kids we it's commonly described like the blind leading the blind this kid is running away from the family system but they're running towards a negative peer group. And that's where they get that. They will come across as defiant because they feel rejected, so they're pushing back and all of that. So um, that's a personality. This is the one that we normally identify as the identified patient. Okay? Because if we don't do a strong enough family background, uh, this shows up as the problem. Child number three comes into the picture. It's called the lost child or the loner. This kid comes into the family, needs the emotional bonding, can't get it, because there's now four people living in the house that are keeping all their feelings in and keeping everybody else out. This kid starts coming across as super independent withdrawn, distant, aloof, quiet, whereas this kid feels rejection, this kid comes across as rejecting everybody else. But the interesting thing is here, they learn to live by themselves. They kind of become successfully isolated from the pain of rejection. This is a family system as the addiction is getting worse among the parents relationship. They sit down for family dinner and an argument breaks out. One reason is because dad's drunk and he has nothing else to do so he's going to argue about anything. Don't take any of this personally. This one is the one who tries to play social worker in the family and tries to make everything nice. This is the one that the fight is probably aimed at. So this kid's busy playing social worker. What does this kid do? Runs away. Runs out of the house. What does this kid do? Doesn't run away. This kid goes quietly up to their room, shuts the door, and gets involved in interesting behaviors. They do their homework. 
They read. They write poetry. They make artwork. They do music. They, this kid learns to learn therapy for themselves by the stuff that they do. Right? How many of you have, te have teaching experience in schools? Well, thank God somebody, kind of. I've never had a group that nobody raised their hand. Okay, with teachers, one of the things I like to, to talk about is you can, you can see family systems work out in the classroom. You know there's one kid or a couple kids in, this, in the class, every time you ask a question, the hand goes up. And that's not the annoying part. The annoying part is every time you ask them the answer, they're right. Okay, And that's them overachieving to protect their own identity. This kid will never raise their hand. They may shout out without raising their hands a wise ass answer, something that they'll get disciplined for. This kid will never raise their hand, but when called upon, will always have the right answer because they've done more homework than anybody else because they're hiding in their room learning that. This kid will also become an artist, music, art, sculpting, all that sort of things that they can do, which what art is, art is when we take our internal feelings and express them in the concrete. So the artist is a way that gives therapy to themselves for being in this situation. Okay. I'm going to. I, I, let me get through the system okay. first, and because I, I, I do want to expose this to other models. Okay. I told you this was a Catholic family, so this is the fourth kid. <laughs> this is the one who is frequently the youngest. The hero is usually the oldest. The mascot is usually the youngest. Um, the mascot is usually the oldest, but in certain cultural groups, the oldest male. But sometimes it could be the, the female. The youngest is called the mascot or the clown. Internal feelings that you're dealing with. Fear, confusion, insecurity, and loneliness. The two primary feelings with this kid, confusion and insecurity. This kid knows there's a need for emotional bonding, can't get it. Because everybody else in the family is keeping their feelings in, keeping everybody else out. What happens with this kid? As this kid learns to verbalize things, the kid says, this family is effed up. <laughs> and what does everybody else say? Oh no, this family's fine. So they're confused by what they're feeling and what they're experiencing. It's two different things. So the insecurity and confusion is there. They start doing anything to get attention. This kid works hard to get attention. This kid will do anything to get attention. It's frequently a lot of clowning and a lot of humor. Because the youngest kid in the family is the plaything. They come across as super cute, fragile. There was a lot of research being done where they were identifying high levels of hyperactivity with these kids. I'm not sure how much that still holds up, but there's a lot of decent history uh, of research that hyperactivity among these kids was pretty high. I think we have enough other kinds of hyperactivity going on right now that may not be as strong an issue. So this kid is getting all their strokes. When the family did, when Thanksgiving dinner is done, and Thanksgiving dinner, by the way, if you haven't figured this out by your age, maybe too late, Thanksgiving dinners for most families are very anxiety producing because we have to go home 
And the problem is when we as adults go home, we lose our current position and we become the kids that used to live in that family system. So when I go home for a holiday like that, now that I'm the oldest in the family, I'm still the oldest kid in the family. Even though my parents are gone, I'm still perceived as the oldest kid. My youngest brother is still the kid, even though we're all adults. But the anxiety is still there. And if you come out of a history with addiction or some other behavioral problem and you go home, then you're still the screw up. So family dinners are not always the best thing. Okay, we do it because we're responsible, but there's a lot of anxiety that comes with it. When that family is gathering and there's a lot of anxiety, this kid becomes the star of the family because all the anxiety gets transformed into the cute little kid. And all that energy goes there. And that's where this kid begins to find their identity in the clowning and acting. Two big cultural icons with this. Johnny Carson, Carol Burnett. They isolate pretty much from, the set and from other people on their own. Put them on stage, they're the life of the party. But again, learning to keep feelings in, keeping everybody else out. Now the last two, I'm just going to tell you what they are, and then we're going to not deal with them. Okay. One is called the hypermature child. This is the one that comes into the family system. This is the surprise pregnancy many years later. So the rest of the family is now adults, and all of a sudden, this new baby comes along. This child will pick up the behaviors and feelings, something like the family hero, except with none of the emotional baggage or dependence on the family. This kid is not looking for that emotional bonding in the same way. The other is the invulnerable child. The invulnerable child looks like the lost child, except without the negative effects, effects and affect. Okay. So the lost child frequently will develop some uh, psychiatric um, diagnoses uh, and possibly need medication for that. Okay. We, do, we don't want to talk about them. That'll take much too much time. Okay. We had, a, now remember this stereotype, if there's any questions, I think we might be able to move the roles around. I just, um, I've had to experience this firsthand, not with my family, but with my ex's family. Um, the father was, a, well, up until, when I, by the time I met them, he was already sober. But he never went to any AA, just quit cold turkey. Um, the, the old, there were three daughters in the family. The, the eldest was definitely the family hero. Like, did everything right, you know. Obviously, didn't do everything, but for the most part, did everything right. The second one actually wasn't the, was actually the lost child, not the scapegoat, mm -hmm. or maybe a cross between the two. And the third one, who I married, was um, almost like a cross between the invulnerable and the, uh, it, and the hyper mature child. Um, also, kind of was like a, a mascot as well, but not as not like clowning around necessarily. Okay. But we're just always positive, always happy, you know, even in spite of her father's shortcomings with alcoholism and whatnot. Always remembered the smell of the beer or, li or liquor on his breath as a positive thing, that helped, like a positive memory and stuff like that. So I've actually seen it firsthand. Yeah, and um, I'll just throw in a little sure, personal sure. stuff with that too. When I was doing my family tree and started up, if you're going to do your family tree, be very careful. You're going to find things that you don't <laughs> want to know. Okay? But when I was doing that, one of the things that I found 
was that my father's father was a very bad alcoholic. My father was not an addict or an alcoholic. I, his addiction was work addiction. Mm-hmm. Okay, And when I say that he was addicted to that, uh, when I was down the gill, there was a, a little, I don't even know if it's there by the same name. There was a place in South Patterson on Main Street called Haufbrau House. The Haufbrau House, German name. It was, it was a German building, but an Italian restaurant. My sister was teaching, and we would get together. We were the only two living in Patterson. So once a week, we'd get together for dinner there. And when I first got some of this material, um, I brought it to dinner. Uh, it was a one-page thing. And I said, um, here, I'm going to the bathroom. Look at this. I think you can use it with your kids. She taught it low tech. And I come back, and my sister, very quiet, the place was very dimly lit. It was kind of like that old German Bavarian type architecture. It's very quiet. There's about two other tables in the place being used. And she yells out, what the F are you talking about our family in public with? I said, what are you talking about? She says, that's you, that's Pat, that's me, and that's Tommy. And I looked at it and said, holy shit. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I wasn't looking at this because I wasn't identifying any alcoholism in our family. When I finally did, it was my father's father, who was apparently very bad alcoholic. My father and his sister were raised 13 years apart as untreated children of alcoholics, and we produced the same kind of family system. So this family system is not just with chemically dependent people. Anytime you have a family that's raising kids with a high level of stress over an extended period of time, you will get these four roles played out. Okay? So it could be addiction. It works well with addiction, but it's also with mental illness. It's also with terminal disease. It's also with any kind of young trauma. If a kid is raised and dad's in prison, the same roles tend to come out. So it's not just addiction, it's high degrees of stress over a long period of time. Okay. So we do this, so one of the things that comes up is what happens, like in your situation, where dad stops drinking but doesn't get into what we would commonly call good recovery, but stops drinking, what happens to the family system? It's commonly called the dry drunk, yeah. and the same thing happens because it's just it's a different stress over an extended period of time. Okay? Now, if you've got a family where there's terminal disease diagnosed, and one of the parents is diagnosed with cancer, they got six months to live. That's a high degree of stress, but it's over a short period of time. So the roles may not be as distinct. But the more the lengthier the stress, the more distinct the roles get. Okay. Um, if dad dies, what do you think happens? Death or divorce? Hey, dad is gone. What happens to the family system? Well, usually one of the roles is that the family will frequently take on a role. Like the oldest uh, uh, role is take care of mom. You, usually, yeah. But wait, what else happens? The family gets lost. They stay the same. When dad's gone in a situation like this, especially if the alcoholism was still going on when, when he died or when the divorce took place, What does mom say every time something goes wrong? You're just like your father. He could be dead in the ground, and he still has influence on the family. So this is why we need family treatment 
not just a lip service type family treatment, but really dealing with the whole family because everybody's got to get healthier. Okay. Um, of the four roles of the kids, who's the healthiest, who's the sickest? Okay, they're all sick. That, that's kind of a cheating answer. <laughs> Who, who, who's the healthiest, who's the sickest? I'd say the lone is the healthiest, the hero is the sickest. Okay, that, uh, that's good insight. That's my choice, <laughs> the, the hero being the sickest, because the hero, in my opinion, your opinions are just as good, but in my opinion, the family hero has to be bought into that craziness in order to maintain the hero status. If that collapses, then the hero is gone. So the hero has a vested interest in keeping the system the way it is for a longer period of time. The other thing that I think is the healthiest is the scapegoat. That's the first one in the family to say, this family is screwed up. I'm out of here. The running away is a sign of health for this kid. One of the things about the family hero, I mentioned the independent life away from the family. The kid will never run away during childhood or young adulthood. But as soon as the kid is able to legitimately and socially acceptably leave the family system, they do. This kid will never go to county college. This kid, if they're from North Jersey, will go to California. University, well, University of Hawaii, that's probably better, okay. <laughs> this kid will join the military. It's a way out of the family system that's highly acceptable. This kid will do anything to get away. I gave this talk several years ago at Seton Hall in the seminary class, and there was a woman in the, in the group, she was a medical missionary sister out of Philly. Medical missionary sisters are all medical professionals before they join. So these are all women that already are physicians, dentists, all that sort of thing. So there's no young kids going into the order. This woman was a nurse, and she joined, and she heard me talk about this, she said, you can use this in your talks. She says, I was the family hero. I volunteered to go to Kenya. And she said, and I planned for Kenya. And I kind of had a quizzical look. And I figured, well, okay, she's going away. She said, that was the first place or was the last place that I could go to without coming home again on the globe. Had she gone any further, she would have been on her way back to Jersey. <laughs> but Kenya was the last stop. It was the furthest away she could get with her order. And I thought that was a rather fascinating insight, but it was something that didn't register until she started looking at these concepts. Because you start looking at these, almost everybody starts identifying family with this because we're all raised with stress over an extended period of time. Can't get away from it. So chances are you've all identified something here that, excuse me, that you relate to. And that's important when you're teaching this material to families, when you're teaching people to clients. Uh, is teaching these relationships to clients because it helps them understand that it's not just their fault of being the scapegoat for the family. All the problems in the family are not based on the addict or what we call as a primary client. It's because we're part of systems that are messed up. Now this is one of the reasons that I'm absolutely fascinated with the profession of marriage and family therapy 
Um, right now, I chair that licensing board too, and it's so difficult for me to not look for a primary client. But in marriage and family therapy, they don't have a primary client. With marriage and family therapy, the patient is the family system. And they're able to look at the picture a little differently, I think in a very healthy way. And those marriage and family therapists that also get some addiction training, they are really on target. The thing is, we don't have many. There are only a few. But marriage and family therapists have a way of looking at a family system a lot better than most of us, because most of us focus on the identified client. The family therapist is going to look at the whole system a whole lot better. One of the reasons I like to use this material with patients is it does put it in a family systems context. Any other questions? Any other things on this? What has changed in women's rights change the gender role in these situations? Uh, that's going to depend on family culture. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes males take on different roles in the families than females and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Let me, since we got a couple minutes, let me throw out a couple things. What do you think happens? when the family hero becomes the, the addict in the family. It, when the family hero becomes the addict, who do you think becomes the codependent? It's another quick, quick uh, trick question here. The yeah, but, but who's the enabler? Mom. Oh, Mom. Any other thoughts? You're half right. When the family hero is the addict, the parent of the opposite sex becomes the codependent. If the girl is, is the addict, dad becomes the codependent. If the boy is the addict, the mom becomes the codependent. Any other thoughts on <coughs> any other thoughts or questions? Sure. Um, is there um, a correlation between um, the number of ages between the children, the number of years between the children? And I say this only because in my family we are we're three sisters and we're nine years apart. And I think that had a lot That's called family planning. <laughs> I'm nine years apart. So my oldest sister is eighteen years older than me. And so I I wonder if that I don't recall any research on that, but in my family, my parents had good family planning. I was the oldest. Four years later, brother number two, or my brother, four years later, my sister. Why? They were planning on college for us. And they figured one at a time was going to be expensive enough. Then they went out to a party or something and came back one night. And two years later, <laughs> my youngest brother was born. They were thinking community college. I, well, yeah. <laughs> so um, my experience is four years. Okay. Um, again, I don't know of any research that talks about what happens with that. Um, I'll tell you what's bad about four years. I was the first one in the family to go to college. Obviously, I got ordained. The May that I got ordained, my brother graduated college. That same year, my sister graduated high school. Who do you think got the party? The oldest one. And years later, my sister uh, specialized in uh, special education. That was her major. She eventually showed me a term paper she did for her graduate uh, project. It was on how people deal 
with their own stigmatization. And part of the project was they had to write a paper on a stigmatized group and how they overcome the stigma. This was like 10 years after I was ordained. She shows me the paper. She wrote a paper on sisters of Catholic priests <laughs> as a stigmatized group. Now, we all went to public, I mean, we all went to Hawthorne High School. Um, also at Hawthorne High School, in her same class, my sister was the head of the color guard and this other one was, um, it, it was an, another girl who was the sister of a pair of twins from Hawthorne, the Halterhoffs, who um, they became best friends. They were their own support group because everybody knew they were sisters of priests. And when you're in public school, what does it mean that you're a sister of a priest? You're going to become a nun. <laughs> Do you know what that does to your dating career? It, they, were, they were popular. They had interesting roles in their class. But there was a stigma attached to it. They became a two-person support group. They both dated guys from West Point. <laughs> That's how far they had to go to get away from their brothers. <laughs> okay, so uh, the the age thing um, again. I don't know of any uh, real stats on that. Um, I, I think most often. I think with my family, it was very specifically they were looking to plan ahead for college, and um, that might be. Nine years, I'd have to fantasize something. You don't want me to I'll fantasize. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want me to fantasize, and you don't want to put it on tape. <laughs> okay. Okay, any other? Maybe. Yeah, is there any research, um, because now how family systems have changed so much in like the last decade I'd so, or so, where more grandparents and things are raising their children, and other people are involved in raising children. Yep. Is there anything that's shown that these roles change or adjust? It depends on if they're going into a healthier setting. So leaving the nuclear family system could be negative or it could be positive. If it's positive, that's going to be a help. If it's negative, it's just going to reinforce the existing roles. No. So then how are you working with, you have clients who are adopted into almost perfect system and their struggles are just almost unbearable. Okay, good question with adoption. With adoption, one of the things I found out over the years, um, I, was, I grew up with a woman we met at a, at a funeral many years later when we were both professionals, and she was a social worker. She was running the adoption agency for Passaic County. And we met at the wake, and it's like, oh, what are you doing for a living? What are you doing for a living and all this? And we got talking, and she told me that one of the best kept secrets about adoption is that 80% of adoptions, and this goes back many years, it may have changed, 80% of the, of the adoptions, one of the reasons for adoption was addiction among the parents. Either the birth mother or the, the birth father. Because they put it up there like this? Yeah which can be a genetic issue because these, these four are equally vulnerable based on genetics. But when kids are put up for adoption, one of the reasons is very often that the parent is addicted and unable to care for the child. So doing the right thing, put them up for adoption, the thing is, one of the things that the adopting parents don't know is what the reason was. So ado uh, when kids are adopted, there's a very high probability that they have a genetic predisposition for addictive disease. Right, so, so that's one of the things. So even though they may be in what appears to be a healthy family system, 
the genetics if they feel some rejection. And a lot of my experience, not all, but a lot of adopted kids still are dealing with some of that rejection thing. And if that's involved and they start drinking or drugging and they've got the genetic predisposition, that could take them off on a trajectory of their own. Another twist to it also is the, the chemical, chemically dependent person, the client, and the adoptive parents who possibly do not come from that background. It is hard for us as clinicians to work with those parents because they can't, it takes a while for them to get to the place where their adopted child who seems so smart, who seems so everything, is chemically dependent. And so the client is able to manipulate. Yeah. When you have a family team meeting, and especially the moms, it's hard for them to come to that place and acknowledge that she is addicted. She has all these traits in her. And even though they know she's adopted, somewhere I think in there they had hoped that when their lifestyle would have changed her. Yeah, and that's part of the, one of the myths that we deal with about how do we control addiction. We don't control addiction. We can treat it, mm -hmm. we can try to get remission, but we can't cure it. And there's no one thing that's gonna fix it. It's a multiplicity of things. And when we're dealing with multicultural families, that, you know, 30 years ago I used to joke, you have, you have a problem. You get an Italian person who marries an Irish one. How do you decide how you're gonna raise the kid in terms of drinking? Is this a normal thing or is this a drunken thing? You know, uh, the cultural differences are, are big. Today, with half of our families divorcing, we're gonna have a very mixed bag of things. And what I would use this kind of material with is let families take a look at it, let them tell you how it works in their family and how it doesn't. I think in most cases, people are gonna identify how it does work with their family. When they can tell you why it doesn't work with the family, then you're identifying the issues that need to be dealt with. Thing, and I didn't get around to this, I, it skipped my mind completely. One of the questions is, how do you take this material and apply it to family therapy? So how do you make the four roles of the kids healthier and the key is integration okay a healthy personality as we understand it in our culture a healthy personality is somebody who's a little bit of a hero a little bit of a wise ass a little bit of a hermit and a little bit of a clown and the goal is to bring these four separate roles and make them overlap. So for instance, one of the things I like to do with family heroes is when you ask a family hero a question, they always have the right answer. The response I try to give is something like, well, that's a good start. Who knows the rest of the answer? Get them used to the fact that they don't have all the answers. They're not always right. Something else needs to be added to what they have. The scapegoat who normally yells out with inappropriate quasi funny stuff for you to respond to that and say gee that's an interesting point I hadn't thought of but there's probably more to the answer than that but that's a good start and they will be flabbergasted that they ever had a correct answer okay the lost child you want to bring them into the mix and when they come up with part of the answer that's correct you want to emphasize that and the clown even when they come up with clowny things uh, to emphasize that that's a good part of the answer but the real trick is to get the four roles integrated and overlapping because we all want to be a little bit of each okay 
So um, as one of the goals of family therapy, if you're working with the whole family like that, uh, to kind of push them in that direction. Okay, uh, the next session, the last session, is officially called Adolescent Stages and Patterns of Adolescent Use and Addiction. Now, I'm going to present this primarily as adolescent use, um, but I'm also going to be throwing in a lot of adult variations on the theme. Uh, because it's, it's the same stages and patterns, uh, but uh, adults have some different angles to it. Um, the way I've used this in the past, one is I've used it in group therapy with adolescents and young adults. And basically, in a group setting, with a group that's familiar with each other, you have them watch the stages and patterns and then ask the individuals to identify which stage they think they're at. And then let the rest of the group agree or disagree or tell them differently from what they see. It's a way of the group helping diagnose the person. The other thing you can use is for individually uh, with adolescent and young adult clients is give them the printed material or now you're going to be able to watch it and say, go over this and next week come in and tell me where do you think you fit into this picture? And let them self-identify. The other thing to do, and this works really good with families um, that don't believe that Junior's got a problem, is let the family look at it and say, let each member of the family say, which stage do you think the client is at? And it helps them self-diagnose their own family. So it's, it's a way of uh, bringing to the surface um, a lot of things which some people are going to understand as secrets that they've never heard anything about. And this brings it to the surface so that you can now talk about it. Um, with peer groups, I've also used this in school settings, not myself, but with interns that I supervise, and you show this to a class, and what you've now done is had the class starts to become an intervention team on some of the students that need it. Because once you show the whole class these four stages, they start talking behind your back. And they start saying, so-and-so is this, uh, this one's that. And you start creating a community that can be ready to help intervene uh, in the future. So I think that's uh, a couple of ways that we can use uh, this last session.